All right, let's get started. So we have uh, two talks on uh, uh, the acute aorta. Uh, today will be the first talk and today we'll cover aortic dissection and some of uh, its variants. And then tomorrow we're gonna cover the second part of acute aortic diseases, which includes the uh, intramural hematoma, penetrating atherosclerotic ulcers, uh, rupturing aneurysms uh, and, and uh, others. So um, uh, you may have heard uh, of some of the background that uh, acute aortic syndrome has been, the term has been coined, in fact, by a cardiologist in, in Spain, uh, Dr. Villa Costa. And the purpose of uh, coining the term acute aortic syndrome was to put it in contradistinction to acute coronary syndrome. So you have patients who have with the, the typical symptoms of uh, acute coronary disease, which is squeezing chest pain, arm, uh, radiating to the arm and to the jaw. And then you have acute aortic syndrome, which is uh, clinically different, which has very sharp uh, pain. It's very acute. Uh, they don't really have a heavy chest, but really sharp pain. And then the uh, diseases that can lead to acute aortic syndrome typically have been grouped as uh, aortic dissection, intramural hematoma and penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer. Otherwise, you will see uh, today and tomorrow that this um, classification is a little bit simplistic and maybe a bit incomplete, but I will try to um, uh, clarify this. Now, acute aortic syndromes, uh, including dissection, are relatively rare disease. So usually in the literature, and there are all kinds of uh, mostly retrospective uh, studies uh, estimate that uh, acute aortas occur about three or 2.5 per 100,000 per year. So it's uh, very rare compared to uh, an acute myocardial infarction. So let's say four is the correct number, then we would have about a factor of 100 times more acute MIs than we would have acute aortic syndromes. So again, which increases the danger that you misdiagnose an acute aortic syndrome and and, uh, and treat the patient with thrombolytics, which is uh, one of those catastrophes that you would like uh, to avoid. So the highest number, interestingly, comes from the UK, and the reason why it seems to be higher there is, uh, I think, only uh, explained by the fact that the study um, by Howard from uh, 2013 was, I think, the only prospective population-based study on the incidence and outcomes of acute aortic dissection. So they, so they looked at the, uh, at the, the whole, uh, um, I don't know, it's kind of a, maybe a county, so Oxfordshire, that short, a little bit short of 100,000 people. And they looked uh, and they watched these people prospectively for uh, 10 years and uh, tried to not to miss any dissection. So it means they looked at people who died in the field, who were, uh, uh, who had died in the hospital, et cetera. And so this explains, I think, why uh, their number is a bit higher. So six per 100,000 is not unrealistic. And also they could document that about half of type A dissections die before they even get to the hospital. The 30-day mortality is also high for those who get into the hospital, also 50% for type A, 13 for type B. But subsequently, once you survive your initial event, the, the five-year survival is, in fact, not that uh, bad. Um, also, what they pointed out is that the chances of having a dissection is obviously increases with age. And if the overall population uh, ages, probably the chances of having more dissections over time is also probably going to go up. So anyway, again, so acute aortic syndromes, aortic dissections are rare. But one of the other reasons why we really uh, want to do it because is we, we see a lot of them at Stanford. So if you look at our numbers here, so we have about one or two acute aortas per week. And uh, as you will find out on call that they tend to come at night or on the weekends. So it's a good idea to be prepared to see these, uh, these patients. Again, about, out of about 60 patients who present with chest pain to the ED, uh, at, uh, at our place. So of all the acute aortic syndrome patients that we have, that we, we reviewed them uh, also a while ago, we found that out of 500 patients, again, the majority have classic dissection followed by 
intramural hematoma, then leaking aneurysm. So you will see probably one of those uh, penetrating ulcers and then uh, limited intimal tear. So again, currently we see about one to two per week or 50, between 50 and 100 in a year. Uh, dependent. So although acute aortic syndromes are rare, uh, we know that they are life-threatening and they are very dramatic. So uh, everybody uh, is uh, aware of this uh, uh, unusual disorder. And the reason why people die from acute aortic dissection is usually from rupture. Uh, so if it's intrapericardial, then they die of tamponade, or if it's uh, anywhere else, then they can just uh, bleed out. And the second most common cause of uh, patients dying from uh, aortic dissection is end organ malperfusion. So we'll discuss these uh, a little more in the future because those patients who rupture in the field, they uh, usually don't have a lot of uh, imaging done and there's not a lot of uh, treatment decisions that are followed from there. But we are more involved in uh, malperfusions. So that's in fact more important for us as imagers. So here's a little uh, uh, quiz case for you. So this is a man. Uh, transferred from an outside hospital. And uh, you can clearly see that the patient has uh, an aortic dissection. And we see a dissection flap here in the arch. This is the ascending aorta. So we see uh, ascending dissection, descending dissection. So it's classically a type A lesion. But then we see a lot of blood in the mediastinum. And uh, uh, obviously, this patient had a ruptured uh, aortic dissection. And so the risk for you is now, so how is it possible that the patient with a type A dissection survives to get a CT scan and he in fact survived this episode and was ultimately taken to the OR? This is because number A, he is a former Navy SEAL. Number B, he ruptured extra pericardial. Or C, the rupture occurred uh, intrapericardial. Okay. And the reason why he survived was simply because he didn't rupture intrapericardial, but extrapericardial. So when you look at this, um, obviously you will have more time when you're on call to look at this, but you can see that the active extrav is here at the origin of the innominate artery. So there's active extravasation from the dissected branch vessel. He has a gigantic mediastinal hematoma, but he does not have a pericardial fluid. So this is all in the mediastinum, this blood. The pericardium is here. The pericardium is very thin and small, so there's no fluid or blood that's trapped in the pericardial space. Otherwise, there's such an amount of blood extravasating from his aorta. If that was trapped in the pericardium, then he probably would not have uh, survived uh, this episode. All right. So it's a rare but life-threatening disease, and uh, the final reason why it's an important disease for us is because these days, the diagnosis and management is really imaging-based, and CT is really the workhorse of diagnosing these, uh, these diseases. And uh, what comes with that, unfortunately, is uh, particularly in this country, that um, for missing acute aortic diseases, uh, there are, that is a not very small chance that uh, you will you can get get sued for this and as you know for any uh, unfortunate thing that can happen in uh, uh, in this country you will probably find a website uh, where you can find a, a group of uh, a malpractice lawyer who will help you uh, uh, sue the institution so for example i just randomly googled this and you'll find there's already a company of uh, or a group of attorneys who a specialized on aortic dissection malpractice uh, lawsuits. And also it's prominent because of there are some, uh, some uh, celebrities that uh, had, uh, had uh, aortic dissection like John Ritter in the past. Just for completeness sake, uh, for diagnosing dissection, there are also some biomarkers. So probably one of these may become important in the future. So there is a, like a solo, solo, soluble elastin fragments uh, that you could detect, uh, would, which would prove that the patient has a dissection. You can imagine from the ED perspective, it would be great if you had a blood test that would tell you if a patient has a dissection or not. But none of those are, uh, uh, I would say, used uh, currently, and they have usually no available reference systems, etc. 
One of a really good test for this section, but not to diagnose it, but to rule it out is in fact the dimer. And that kind of makes sense if you think about it, the dimer is essentially a, a product of, uh, of uh, fibrinolysis. And uh, if a patient dissects, you have so much coagulation going on that obviously your D-dimer will be sky high. But if your D-dimer is normal or very low, that makes it very unlikely that the patient has, uh, in fact, a uh, uh, aortic dissection. Okay, so what we're going to cover briefly in the next uh, hour or so will be first a brief coverage of the imaging strategy. So how do we uh, scan patients with suspected acute aortic syndromes? And I'll spend some time explaining the underlying pathology and the anatomic spectrum. I think the pathology is important because once you understand how the wall looks and what the wall components are, it will help understanding some of the weird imaging phenomena that we see. And also, I'm going to explain some of the anatomic spectrums and just uh, clarify some of those. We'll spend some time uh, discussing side branch ischemia and uh, what our role is in triaging those patients. And uh, finally, I'll uh, show you some examples of uh, a dissection variant, the so-called limited intima. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's start with the imaging strategy. I think number one, uh, particularly at this site where you have a lot of acute aortas, we always do non-contrast scans in patients with uh, acute aortic syndromes. And the main reason is simply because we don't want to miss uh, intramural hematomas. I mean, that's really uh, why you need non-cons. You see this uh, hyperattenuating, crescenting uh, shaped uh, uh, wall thickening in the ascending aorta, also the descending aorta. You see a little dark line here. So the dark line is, uh, is intima or rhombus or atherosclerosis sitting on the intima. So it's very hard to see that this is hyperattenuating relative to blood if you have already contrast uh, on board. So if you narrow the window in the window settings, then it uh, comes out uh, much better. The second thing is uh, if you have a patient with an acute aortic syndrome, you always want to image from the thoracic inlet down to the femoral artery bifurcation. Uh, and the reason is not necessarily because you need to know if the, where the dissection ends, but because even if the dissection ends in the, uh, above the diaphragm, you still want to have a chest, abdomen, pelvis because you want to have a roadmap for an interventionalist or a vascular or cardiothoracic surgeon uh, if you want to put in an endograft. So endografting is very hard if you don't know in which groin, uh, if you go on the left or the right femoral artery, if you're going to be in the true or the false lumen. So you need the the uh, aortic bifurcation and the femoral arteries as a roadmap for uh, intervention. And then what we have done over the last um, about the 20 years or so, we usually use ECG gating for the uh, of the chest component of that uh, and um, historically, we have uh, done this also even on the 16-row scanner. And uh, it's quite remarkable what you can see if you have this uh, dynamic uh, 4D data sets. And you can see this patient who had a really high pulse pressure of 170 over 20. And you see this could be explained by the fact that this intimal tissue, which is completely uh, almost circumferential uh, delamination of the inner layer of the aortic wall here getting whipped around by the bloodstream. And you can also see how the, how the true lumen gets bigger and smaller in the descending thoracic aorta. So those are kind of interesting observations. And to make the diagnosis, you don't necessarily need a 4D data set. Uh, but the main reason why you want to have a gated CT data set is shown on, on this case. And um, so I want to ask you to look at these images and then decide for yourself if you think that the patient has an acute aortic problem or not. And you can see there on the axial images, there is a double contour here at the uh, uh, proximal ascending aorta. And then here you see kind of little zigzag lines here. So this, I think this was from a, from a 16 row scanner. So the question for you now is, does this patient have a uh, aortic lesion? So does he have aortic dissection or something similar? 
or does he have, or is this clearly a pulsation artifact? And then you can decide for yourself if you are more for A or for E, or you say, well, C, if you're very honest, you'll say, well, I don't know, I can tell it's a C. If you say, well, I think it's, I'm not sure, but I think it's more likely an artifact, or you say, oh, it's more likely a, a dissection. Uh, so that's the options that you have now in this, uh, uh, on this slide. But as you know very well, in the real life or in real call, the surgeons would only want to hear either A or E. So the, all of these ones are in the gray zone, and the gray zone is not really helpful for clinical decision making. So what the clinicians want to know, do you think it's an artifact or is this an aortic lesion? And all this uncertainty uh, is a, a, a problematic. And this is, I think, where uh, the ECG getting really makes a difference because this patient was brought back for a gated study for uh, because of also of these findings and also of other findings. And now if you ask yourself again, does this patient have any aortic lesion, yes or no, and how certain you are, I would think that almost everybody on this, uh, uh, on this call would say that, well, that's definitely an aortic lesion. Even we are not sure what kind of lesion that is, and as we can discuss later, but that's a definite aortic lesion. That there's no doubt because all the pulsation artifacts are uh, in fact strong. So this is definitely an aortic lesion. So I think the ECG gating really helps with the certainty of uh, identifying uh, some of these artifacts. It also comes up often when you get an outside study referred where the the surgeons show you a case and say, this is a patient who is referred for type A repair, and you see pulsation artifacts on those images. And before getting a patient to the OR, uh, you want to rather re uh, repeat the CT scan. Let's say if the patient is stable enough, use this with scaling, and you can easily solve the problem. OK, so the next important part to understanding uh, aortic dissection is understand more about the pathology, or essentially I would argue the understand the wall properties uh, that we are dealing with. So this is a little bit of an exaggeration in this cartoon, but uh, what it should um, uh, illustrate is that the aorta has a very thin intima, and then there's a base membrane, etc. There's usually a few layers of cells, uh, so it's on a microscopic scale. So the intima itself, it would have a hard time seeing. The adventitia, at least some portion of it, the collagenous portion is, uh, is also thin. It's, uh, it's a very tough tissue. It's usually collagen, collagen is like a cellophane. The cellophane wrap that is like the last layer of defense uh, that prevents the aorta from rupturing. But the substance of the aorta or of any of those large arteries, or you can even say the meat of the aorta, because it is smooth muscle cells, it's a muscle, a muscle, muscular tube, if you want, is the media. So the aortic media, interestingly enough, uh, itself is made up of usually 70 identical layers, and they are called the elastic lamina of the aortic wall. And uh, each of those lamina consists of, you can see this uh, blue sheath here with the little holes in between, that's, uh, that's elastin, which is one amorphous kind of a sheath uh, that's um, like rubber, essentially. And then uh, you have some collagen fibers as well. And then you have the next uh, elastin sheath here. And between those elastin sheath, you have uh, smooth muscle cells and ground substance and fibrillina, these, these smaller uh, little uh, uh, fibrillar structures that connect those sheets together. And so an, an adult, a uh, human has approximately 70 layers of the aorta. Uh, a, a hamster has maybe 10, and an elephant has maybe, I don't know, 120 of those layers. But the building blocks of these uh, arterial layers, of the aortic layers, are always the same, at least in, in, in mammals. Now, and the, the uh, main material composition and material properties are really determined by elastin, so by this rubber-like uh, substance that uh, gives the elasticity of the aortic medium. Now, if you have any disease or disorder or mechanical effect that 
ruins the structural integrity of the media, then those layers uh, are no longer um, connected to each other. And there are a lot of different diseases that can affect the, the raw integrity. And uh, if that happens, then you can suddenly develop cystic spaces, or you can essentially have spaces within the media where a potential blood could get in and then dissect the aorta. So the main point here is that if you have a normal aorta, uh, you do not have any space within those layers, and the normal aorta will never dissect. Yes, you cannot dissect the normal aorta under normal circumstances. Otherwise, all our trauma CTs would have dissections, but, but they don't. And so what has been described histologically is as a consequence of all kinds of uh, diseases. If the media is abnormal, you have a potential space in the media, which has been termed cystic media necrosis. Uh, it's a bit of a misnomer, but I think it describes what happens. You have a potential space in the media. And uh, uh, cystic media disease, again, can, is the common end path of a lot of different diseases. So for example, in Marfan's disease, you have fibrillin abnormal, among others. Uh, in Ehlers Danlos type 4, it's collagen, which is abnormal. And there uh, is familial thoracic aortic aneurysm. They usually have some, uh, some uh, uh, smooth muscle cell, uh, intracytoplasmatic, uh, um, intramuscular skeleton that is abnormal. But also epidemiologically, the main reason why the media gets damaged is from severe uh, uncontrolled hypertension so, and also normal aging. So I think it's just a consequence of pounding of the pulse pressure on the aortic wall uh, millions or billions of times uh, over, over your life. And if this is done under severe hypertension, it just degrades the aorta faster than, uh, uh, than not. All right. So, uh, Here's uh, just a picture of uh, Dr. Ertheim, uh, which is uh, another genius coming from Vienna, Austria, just in case uh, you were wondering. The modern pathologic uh, classification is obviously more complex, but in, in principle, it just, it's, it's a classification that tries to quantify more how much of elastin is abnormal, how much mucute uh, extracellular matrix is abnormal, how much smooth muscle cell loss is, et cetera. There's nothing that is really particularly important for us. But now, equipped with the knowledge that the aorta can only dissect if you have abnormal media that allows blood to separate the different layers, we can now look at the spectrum and classification of uh, aortic dissection. So what the, main, the key elements of aortic dissections are number one, you need to have what's called a primary intima tear. You need to have essentially a hole in the intima that allows blood to get into the wall and uh, then uh, dive down and separate the remainders of the aortic wall uh, and delaminate essentially the, the inner layers of the media from the, the rest of the media. So this is called a primary intima tear. Nobody still knows, has witnessed this life, how this happens and why it happens at certain locations and what the exact mechanism is. But obviously, if you want to have a true and a false lumen, you need to have a hole where the blood uh, ultimately gets in. So this is a 3D image of that. You can see uh, a small intima uh, tear here and the blood gets into that, uh, uh, into the uh, media space here. And the, pa the patient was later taken to the cath lab, and he has by then already developed a full-blown dissection here. But the nice thing about this case is that it's a very nice 3D image of a primary intima tear. So this is how a primary intima tear looks like. So an intima tear is not the same as a dissection flap, right? So you have to distinguish it. The intima flap is the hole where the blood gets into the dissection or into the, uh, into the false lumen. It's important to distinguish because uh, the, the primary intima tear is a potential treatment target because you could cover it with an uh, uh, endograph. So once the blood gets into the uh, aortic wall, into the media, there has to be a pre-existing 
kind of uh, cystic media necrosis or some space that allows then the blood to separate the media into kind of an outer portion and an inner portion. So the false lumen is in fact within the media. It's not between the intima uh, and the media and also not between the adventitia, but it's usually within the media, usually about two thirds uh, through the thickness of the media. And then also important, but has been often ignored is, you have to have a primary intima tear, then a false lumen, and obviously you also need to have some exit tear. So somehow the blood has to get out of that uh, false lumen again, because if not, then it would probably clot off and then would become an intramural hematoma. So these we call usually re-entry tears or natural fenestrations if they come off where there is a branch vessel. So that's the basic uh, building blocks of a classic aortic dissection. And then the true and the false lumen can come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. So, so usually the false lumen is larger than the true lumen, but it's not a given. And as you've seen on the movie earlier that the, the flap, in fact, moves back and forth over the cardiac cycle. And uh, in the worst case scenario, you can have the, the false lumen so large that it even compresses the true lumen, which would be called a true lumen collapse. But most of the time, I don't think any of you would have difficulties distinguishing the true from the false lumen. The easiest is always to trace it all the way back to the heart. And if you see here, the blood comes out of the heart. That's true lumen and that's false lumen. And you can see here, it turns out the, the true lumen here is a little bit larger. The false lumen is a little bit smaller. Again, size alone doesn't really tell you the difference. But what I use as a clue to tell what is true and false lumen if I don't have a whole data set, for example, is that if you think about what that flap is made of, uh, we know it's made of mostly of media. Media is mostly made of elastin, and elastin behaves essentially like a rubber band. So if you think about that, the true lumen is surrounded by the rubber band of media, then it's relatively easy to identify where the true and the false lumen is, because here, that's the lumen that's round and that's surrounded by a rubber band. And even if the rubber band is kind of pushed in a little bit, you will still see that that's the, the true lumen. So it's the, the mental picture of that flap being a part of this elastic tissue that will always try to retract, will help you uh, differentiating true from false lumen if there is a, a, any doubt. Now you can have very different uh, manifestations of dissection too. So uh, sometimes the dissection can not only delaminate, let's say half the circumference of the aorta, but it can delaminate almost the entire aorta. And then you get a funny picture like this, where you have a, like a, a ring in the ring sign, if you want, because the elastic uh, portion of the, of the inner media will contract and will get into its uh, stable state. You can have a complete delamination as well. And then it has consequences, what happens to that tissue uh, further on if there's an additional rupture. And if you cut on your CT image through the true lumen, the false lumen, and the portion of the primary intimal tear, which also can have, can be large or small, and you can get all kinds of funny appearances. And I think one of the confusing things that you may encounter is that uh, in a typical dissection, you have a relatively small or circumscribed primary intimal tear, that then fills the false lumen. But you can have a situation where the primary intima tear is large or, or you have a complete circumferential tear of your intima tubing, if you want. And then that tubing that's delaminated from the aortic wall can then prolapse downstream in diastole into the uh, left ventricle or through the aortic valve plane. Or what also can happen is if you have a delaminated circumferentially delaminated aortic wall, then that tube could be pushed downstream and that's called an intima intersusception. So once you know that this exists, you always pick it up. I think it's not particularly difficult to diagnose, but it's just uh, important to be aware of. The, the, um, the pitfall for both of these cases is that you will have a segment like here, for example, of the mid ascending aorta where the aorta looks surprisingly normal. The reason is because you don't see a flap or anything here because all the 
resected tissue has been pushed out of your uh, field of view, either distally or proximally. And I'll show you a couple of examples like this. So this is a patient who had a proximal prolapse. Again, the interesting part is that we, I think everybody will make the diagnosis that the patient had a dissection, the second thing in the arch, and here even in the distal ascending order. But the confusing part is this one here. You have an image that looks normal, I would say almost normal. I think those of you who uh, pay attention uh, probably see, well, this little pixel here is not perfectly normal. And then the root, hard to tell, is this a piece of the valve, or is this a flap, so it's not quite clear what it is. But I think most of you would probably say, well, this is suspicious enough, and the patient probably needs to go to the R. But since we had a gated study in this patient, we can do a, a 4D movie, which uh, we have to practice now, those of you who are on call, because maybe later tonight you'll get a patient like this and you want to make a movie uh, for the surgeons. Uh, but if you watch the, uh, the morphology here, it's really quite uh, impressive. So this is the patient's uh, dissection, descending aorta, arch, and the ascending aorta. And then the remainder of the dissection flap, you know, it should continue to go all the way down here, right? So this piece of the flap is missing. And we can see it, though, because it's right here. So this is the flap that was originally connected to this part of the aorta. And this is not the aortic valve because the aortic valve is here. But here's the aortic valve level. This is the left coronary. So the flap is above the left coronary. So this is a displaced uh, flap, which explains why that cut that we saw on this line looked almost normal. And when you have a 40 view, you can actually see how that flap gets uh, whipped around again by the bloodstream. And you can see in diastole, the flap prolapses through the valve plane. So again, you could argue, well, the truth is to make the diagnosis. You don't make the, uh, don't need to make a video or anything like this. So uh, you should, you can relax now. The value of those images, I think, is mainly uh, in explaining the, uh, the actual imaging findings. And the value of gating in this study is mainly because you can clearly tell the surgeons where the, uh, flap is relative to the coronary arteries. So it won't change their surgical approach because they will fix whatever they find when they open the patient up and this patient has to go to the OR anyway. But it helps them anticipate that they, in this case, they probably have to fix the root as well and not only the, uh, the ascending. Right. So here's the other example, the patient who has an intima intersusception. I won't go into all the patient's uh, history, which was quite complex, but what you can see here is that uh, the patient, uh, this was a non-gated study, but you see there's, there's no flap in the ascending aorta, but this is a very diseased ascending aorta because there's in fact no intima or intimal media in a layer because all of the tissue has been pushed downstream into the into the left subclavian artery and into the uh, uh, aortic arch. That's what's called an intima intersusception. And you can see this in the arch. You can also see this in the descending thoracic aorta. It's very rare, but um, you may uh, encounter it here. And again, if you've seen it once and you've heard that it exists, then you'll always be able to diagnose this. And one of our IR colleagues has uh, called this uh, the, the mitochondrial sign, which is when you have this rolled up sleeve of uh, uh, intima tissue into the arch. Right, so that's the complex ones. Uh, and then uh, here's just another cartoon of intima intersusception where you have a completely circumferential delamination and you have a completely a tear of that tube and then the tear gets, the torn intima tube gets then pushed out of this thing. Okay, so that's the anatomic spectrum. Um, the next thing is uh, how do we classify aortic dissection and uh, the clinical classification typically has been acute, less than two weeks of symptoms and chronic, more than two weeks of symptoms. And it seems a bit arbitrary at first, but it comes mainly from the surgical literature in the 70s uh, that uh, if you operate a patient who had his dissection more than two weeks ago, they usually it doesn't change the outcome. So usually if a patient survives two weeks, there's usually no need to take them to the OR anymore. So that's why acute dissection is everything within two weeks. 
and uh, everything after has been called a chronic dissection. Now, now uh, this is viewed a little bit differently because now since we have uh, an alternative to surgical repair, which is uh, endovascular aortic repair, so you have a wider time window and the decisions that you could do. And also, I think pathologically and biologically, it makes sense to uh, separate the aortic dissections into acute, uh, subacute, and chronic phases. Because in these two weeks, in two weeks to three months, there's a lot of things that are going on. You have to imagine you have a, a new flow channel uh, in, in the aortic media. Now, this whole thing has to re endothelialize again. The outer wall is under new wall tension. It has to remodel. It has to, to react to this. And we know also from imaging follow ups that in the first three months, the false lumen grows relatively fast and then it grows slower from then. And so there are a lot happens just in this time. And so currently most people would argue that the chronic refers to everything after three months and uh, the two weeks, two, three months, we would call uh, subacute. There's a, an, an excellent article that explains all of the pathology that goes on in this time uh, uh, that has been recently published. Now the uh, anatomic classification uh, is based usually or what we should look for is the location of the dissection flap. So if you go for the Stanford classification, the only piece of information you need is to know where the dissection flap is. But again, these days, we also want to mention uh, where the primary intima tear. So uh, because that is a separate piece of information in addition to the dissection flap. They're obviously correlated, but they're not. I don't think I want to explain the Bakian classification again here, but uh, let me make the main point here uh, that explain what the type A and type B dissection is, because that is often confused in the literature and even in several textbooks. Uh, and I didn't even know and I didn't understand it correctly uh, until I came here and was a uh, uh, I would say taught what type A and type B is uh, by some of the co-authors that were still around of uh, this original 1970s paper where this was defined. So uh, what a type A aortic dissection means is that we have the dissection flap that involves the ascending aorta, okay? And a type B is just the opposite of A. It means a dissection that does not involve the ascending aorta. The reason why it is uh, separated like this is because type A dissection from a surgical perspective needs surgery. And if the ascending aorta is not involved, then you can't really do anything about it, or it, at least you don't have to do immediately, uh, then it's uh, uh, a type B dissection. And uh, if you look at some of the textbooks or, or articles or review articles, you will see typically these cartoons that look somewhat like this. You have a, a section that starts in the ascending aorta and goes, I don't know, to any extent down the descending thoracic aorta. And everybody agrees that this is a type A dissection. And then you have the example, the corresponding example for a type B dissection, which is usually illustrated with a dissection flap starting distal to the subclavian artery, which is, in fact, the most common presentation of these kind of dissections. But the whole question and the confusion comes up if you find a patient where the dissection starts in the arch. And the question here is now, is this a type A dissection or is this a type B dissection? And uh, I think I have an example here. So this is a patient here who has, um, who has a dissection which clearly involves the arch because here you see the patient's subclavian artery. This is the carotid, so the flap starts distal to the carotid artery, so that's obviously in the arch. So the question is, do we call this a type A, or do we call this a type B aortic dissection? Again, if you put yourself in the surgeon's shoe and say, okay, is this a patient that needs to go to the OR, yes or no? Or translated into the classification, does the dissection involve the ascending aorta, yes or no? require immediate surgical repair. And in that case, the answer is no. So it does not involve the ascending aorta. Hence, they wouldn't take a patient to the OR for that kind of dissection. Uh, so 
this would be classified correctly as a type B aortic dissection. So if you wanted a landmark between type A and type B, it's not the subclavian artery, but it's the, uh, it's the innominate artery or the brachiocephalic artery. But everything proximal to that would be type A, and distal to that would be type B. Okay. And if you are unsure, and if you're not sure how you want to call it, you could always uh, just be descriptive. You could say uh, there's an acute aortic dissection beginning in the mid-arch and ending in the descending thoracic aorta. This will always be correct. You don't even have to say type A or type B. It's better than uh, to, to classify it wrong. So again, type A needs to go to surgery because uh, the, the mortality rate even in the 20, first 24 hours of those patients, it's like 25% or in, in 48 hours, it's like 50%. So the mortality of type A dissection is very high and currently can only be fixed surgically. And uh, the, the surgical repair for a type A dissection is uh, usually an interposition graft. So you, it's the same word as tube graft repair or supracoronary ascending repair or supracoronary interposition graft repair. So essentially it means they do not touch the aortic root, they don't touch the arch, they just replace the ascending aorta. So that's what's called an ascending repair. And they try to just get away with this to save a patient's life in the acute, in the acute situation. And then depending on a surgical, if, if needed, they have to go more proximally. So sometimes they have to repair the root. Let's say if they if the root is totally destroyed and the coronary ostia are ripped off, then you obviously need to fix the root as well. And some surgeons also, in terms of longer term outcomes, uh, include some repair of the arch. So some patients have ascending plus hemi arch, some patients have ascending plus root, and some patients have uh, root ascending and hemi arch repair. So these are just examples. This is a patient who had a composite valve graft repair plus hemi-arch, so this is the root is replaced as a mechanical valve, and you see the graft goes all the way here under the undersurface of the arch. So this is just what the current uh, uh, surgical uh, procedure is. So for type B dissection, the treatment is different. So for type B dissections, the treatment is usually uh, conservative. So usually medical management, which means give them a lot of beta blockers and uh, pain medication, and uh, hope that they uh, stay stable. And uh, about two thirds of patients with type B dissection respond to medical management and they do fine. Uh, but patients who have what's called a complicated type B dissection, they usually need some uh, treatment. And this is where these two terms come in and you probably have heard them before. So again, uncomplicated type B dissection means that you manage them medically uh, and they do fine and they don't develop complications. Whereas complicated type B dissections are those that require either surgical, which is still rarely done in type Bs, for example, in patients with connective tissue disease, but most of the time they need endovascular repair. And the complications that prompt endovascular repair is usually a rupture of the aorta and branch ischemia and progression in the short interval or if they have uncontrollable hypertension or pain, uh, so then uh, they usually get treated. And again, the most common treatment for complicated type B sections now is a uh, endovascular repair. And again, a lot of that pioneering work uh, comes from here. So Mike Dake was here, the chief of IR a few years ago. He was the first person to, to uh, treat an aortic dissection with a homemade stent graft, and Craig Miller is still around. He's one of the cardiothoracic surgeons uh, here. Uh, this is an example of what they did in this uh, very early uh, paper here. And you can see here's the primary intima tear. So the goal of a stent graft was uh, to cover the primary intima tear, and by that, redirect the flow back into the, uh, into the true lumen. Uh, that's the main uh, uh, benefit of that. Um, and um, they had just had an anniversary relatively recently where they celebrated all of that. So it's, it's not that long ago that endografting has become that um, uh, method of choice. So as I mentioned earlier, if you just want to identify the patient's type A or type B dissection, you only need to know where the flap is, you know, nothing else. 
But again, since we are now in the area of, era of endovascular treatment, you now you also want to know where the primary intima tears. And the reason is because a primary intima tear itself can be a treatment target. So if you have a type A dissection, you can have your, uh, your, uh, your primary intima tear also in the ascending aorta, but your primary intima tear could also be in the arch, and then it dissects retrogradely, or it could be even in the descending aorta, and the, and the aorta dissects retrogradely all the way to the aortic valve. Okay, so because the ascending aorta is involved with the dissection, doesn't mean that the primary intima tear has to be in the ascending aorta. And for type B dissections, obviously, if you have uh, the, uh, depending on what, the, what segment is involved, but if you have a dissection that starts in the arch but doesn't involve the ascending aorta, which makes it B, the primary intima tear could be in the arch, but it also could be in the descending aorta or even in the branch vessel, theoretically. And the reason why you want to be specific about this or sometimes this makes a big treatment difference is shown in this example. That's a bit of a complicated case. You have a patient who clearly has a, a type A lesion because we see on the contrast enhanced study, we see uh, something that looks like a flap in the ascending aorta and the descending looks just like a classic section. I mean, there's no doubt that the patient has a aortic dissection. The one thing that is uh, uh, obviously disturbing is that he has a, a rupture, right? You see, you see a hemothorax here, uh, pleural fluid, so obviously uh, that's uh, not a good sign. And then the confusing thing a little bit may be that you see that you wonder why is this part of the aorta not right? Why is it not contrast opacified? Because if you would think that the ascending aorta is dissected and there's a primary intima tear close to the root, then this would have to be contrast opacified. And you say, well, maybe it's an intramural hematoma and it's clogged. But then when you look at the non-con, it's not clogged, right? So it's uh, not hyper attenuating. And then when we look at the sagittal reformats of this study, which was non-gated, you see all these zigzag configurations of that order here between the true and the fourth. And that this, this just tells you that there is a flap that is moving. The reason why it's not opacified is simply because the primary intima tear in this patient is not in the ascending aorta, but the primary intima tear is somewhere in the descending aorta. And so the blood gets into the false lumen right here, and it goes downstream to the descending uh, aorta, and it also goes retrogradely upstream into the ascending aorta. And that's the only way how you can explain why you have non-opacified blood and the moving dissection flap in that aorta. And you may encounter cases like that. And the treatment decision can be slightly different than what we just heard before, because by all means, the patient with a type A lesion should go to surgery and get his ascending aorta replaced. But this particular patient was a very poor uh, surgical candidate and they had compliance issues, etc. And so if you have a situation where you have the primary intima tear here, and no primary intima tear in the ascending aorta, you could at least consider treating this patient with a stent graft, but put the stent graft in the descending thoracic aorta. And that was done in this case. So if you can convince yourself that that's the primary intima tear, you can cover this, prevent blood to flow into that false lumen, and by that also decrease the pressure in the false lumen in the ascending aorta, and maybe by that uh, get away with uh, uh, treating the patient percutaneously without the sternotomy and then ascending replacement. This just illustrates that the flap, let's say the true lumen, false lumen separation, and the primary intima tear, again, are two separate uh, uh, entities. And so I don't want to go into any detail here, but essentially if you look uh, in, the, in the literature, about one third of patients who have a type A dissection do not have their primary intima tear in the ascending aorta. And you, you probably hear the term retro A, and that's what it refers to. It just means that the tear is distal of the ascending aorta, and then the dissection is, develops retrogradely. It's also a typical complication of 
IP dissection repair with an endograft. So you can have a complication. You put an endograft into the descending aorta, and it generates a new little tear in the descending aorta, which then retrogradely dissects into the Okay. So what do you look for when you have a patient with a aortic dissection? The first thing I always look is where is a dissection flap because this tells you if it's type A versus type B. Again, if the ascending aorta is not involved, don't call it A because if you do, you're going to call the cardiothoracic surgeons, not the vascular surgeons. Then the cardiothoracic surgeons will know that you don't know what you're talking about. So don't call uh, a type A dissection if there is nothing in the ascending aorta. It can be purely descriptive, this will always be correct. So once you ha have a diagnosis of dissection, you also want to figure out where the primary intima tear is, particularly if it's a type B dissection, because is this in a location where you can cover it with a stent graft, or ideally at least two centimeters distal to the subclavian, or if you want to tell them exactly where it is or make some pictures for that. And then are there any complications? Because uh, if there are no complications, it's B, it will be probably uh, uh, medical management. If there are complications, then they usually need an endovascular surgical repair. Okay, so that's that. So the next uh, topic uh, briefly is now uh, malperfusion. We mentioned that the malperfusion of the branch vessels is an important cause of death in patients with acute aortic dissection, both A and B. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, that uh, particular problem. Now, again, a little quiz for you, just uh, uh, make the, put the answer mentally on your uh, paper, piece of paper. The question is, uh, if you have patients with aortic dissection and with side branch malperfusion, which of these side branch malperfusions has the highest mortality? Is it in, is it an involvement of the coronaries, the, the, the supra arch vessels of the brain arteries, uh, renal, mesenteric, or peripheral arteries? So what do you think? I obviously thought, well, of course, it has to be the coronaries or the, the, uh, the cerebral arteries, but it's a trick question, because the trick question is that it's for those patients who make it to the hospital where we see a CT scan. And then you'll probably check of these ones because if you have coronary involvement to a degree that there is a acute uh, coronary ischemia or that you have a, a massive cerebral infarction, then these patients may not make it uh, to the hospital. But of those patients who make it to the hospital, the highest mortality is in fact related to mesenteric ischemia. And um, um, all of you have imaged a patient with mesenteric ischemia and you know that uh, the small bowel or the bowel mucosa in general doesn't tolerate ischemia very well. And after two hours, uh, you can have a sloughing off of mucosa and you can have bowel necrosis relatively quickly. So, uh, whereas renal, if you have a renal ischemia, you may have uncontrolled hypertension or you may end up on dialysis, but you may not necessarily die immediately from it. And peripheral uh, artery involvement also has a high mortality, but it's mainly because it's a marker of the overall extent of the disease. Again, mesenteric ischemia is usually the biggest problem here. Now, one important um, piece of information, and maybe I should go back to this slide, is, uh, is this one here. Now, the diagnosis of side branch ischemia is not an imaging diagnosis. You have to be careful uh, with doing this. And uh, again, I'm, I've learned from my own mistakes. So if you have a a renal artery, one coming off the true and one coming off the false, and the one from the false lumen doesn't enhance very well, I would have called this, oh, there's ischemia of the uh, right kidney, which comes off the false lumen. But if you think about it, just because the false lumen doesn't opacify as much, it could be just opacified later because it's larger, and then the blood pressure in the false lumen could still be perfectly fine the perfusion pressure to the kidney also could be perfectly fine. So like enhancement differences and things like that uh, don't tell you that an organ is uh, ischemic. Of course, if you see, uh, I don't know, if you see a bowel necrosis, that it's different. But uh, the initial diagnosis or the suspicion is clinical. So we shouldn't overcall it. But once 
a diagnosis or the suspicion of, for example, branch ischemia or mesenteric ischemia has been made, then it's important for us to really determine the mechanism. And uh, this is done by, by imaging because the main mechanism is how you can have a branch vessel ischemia is you can have a local obstruction of the specific branch vessel, or you can have a more global problem uh, that's related to limited inflow typically into the uh, true lumen. Now let me show you some examples to explain this. So this is local problem, right? In an uncomplicated dissection, let's say these are the renal arteries here, you have a, a true lumen and a false lumen, this is our rubber band here. And whenever you rip off that part of the uh, inner layer of the aortic wall from a location where there's a side branch, you have to have a little hole here because that was the pre-existing ostium here. Okay, so this we call a re-entry tear or a natural fenestration. So this is, doesn't cause any ischemia, any problems for any of those vessels. You can have some local problems though if the intima tissue or intima medial tissue within the side branch kind of starts to roll up and then start to make a thrombus formation and embolize distally and make an occlusion of that vessel. Or you can have narrowing of that vessel because the dissection in fact extends into it. And even if it uh, uh, doesn't extend all the way through or with a, with a little outflow here, this can cause branch vessel ischemia or a more severe situation would be if you have a false lumen extending into the branch vessel and the false lumen within the branch vessel doesn't have an exit tear, which is called a windsock within the branch vessel. That causes a problem because that false lumen can compress the true lumen in that side branch. So all these are local problems and all of these you could theoretically fix by putting in a wire into the true lumen, then putting in a balloon and a stent and uh, just opening up that, that branch vessel. The different situation is this one here. So this is a patient who has uh, mesenteric and renal ischemia. But the reason here is that uh, you see the true lumen here is completely collapsed. So the true lumen is just within those two layers of the rubber band, and the false lumen compresses the true lumen. And the problem with that is that now all the vessels that come off the true lumen, they may be ischemic because they just don't get any inflow. And so you may wonder, why is it even possible? So why would the true lumen collapse? And it has something to do with the, with the physiology and the pressures and the flows in the aortic dissections, because we mentioned earlier that you need a primary intima tear for the blood to get in, and you have a true and a false lumen, and then you need re-entry tears or fenestrations for the blood to flow out again. Now, the pressure in the true and the false lumen essentially depends on what resistance the outflow vessels have. And uh, if you look, for example, at the, in our data sets, or this is from a 40 flow data set, this is a patient who had a, this is from a chronic dissection, but you can see a little hole from an intercostal artery here. And you can see that in systole, the blood flows from the true lumen and the false lumen. But when you look very carefully, you will see that in diastole, the blood flows from the false lumen into the true lumen, which proves that in diastole, the pressure is higher in the false lumen and in the true lumen, otherwise it wouldn't flow in this direction. Right? And you've seen this probably on CT scans too in the past. So this is obviously a false lumen in a patient with chronic dissection, but you can see that the flow is from the false lumen to the true lumen. So you can have a situations where in diastole, the pressure in the false lumen is higher. There's another situation is a patient after a stent graft, I'm just showing you that you can see how the, how the diastole is much longer, so you have blood flowing in diastole from the false lumen back into the true lumen. You see this jet here. So that once you understand that that can happen, uh, you and uh, you can even simulate this. So the, uh, so Katrin is one of our researchers. She did some nice work in uh, in this by uh, trying to simulate this on patient uh, specific data. And uh, so you, you you segment the patient, you you calculate what the flow into the true and the false lumen is, and then you can try to estimate the pressure difference between the true and the false lumen. But I mean, the long story short, so what we currently think 
is happening in these situations is you have uh, blood flowing into the false lumen, and in diastole, the resistance is high because you have, let's say, only intercostal arteries or only uh, the iliac arteries, which are also high resistance vessels at rest, or you have even no entry tear at all. You can even have a windsock in the aorta as well. So if you have that situation, so you have an easy outflow from the true lumen, but limited outflow from the false lumen, then the pressure in the false lumen can build up over a couple of cardiac cycles, and it will result in a true lumen collapse with all the consequences of uh, potentially uh, malperfusion of all the branch vessels that come off the, of the true lumen. So why is it important to distinguish that? Well, because the treatment uh, for this problem is different than for the local problems that we mentioned. So you could think, well, the patient has ischemic uh, kidney, so why don't we go in and put in a stent graft into that renal artery this is a, a historic example, which I got from Jeff Rubin uh, a few years ago, but it illustrates very nicely that there's no point in putting a stent into a renal artery, even if the kidney is ischemic, if it's not the renal artery's fault, but it's because the true lumen is collapsed. So there's no flow from upstream in the true lumen to get to there at all. So to stent this locally is not uh, really a, a viable solution. So what you do again in these patients is you use a stent grafting or endografting. And again, the goal is here, so here's a patient's primary intima tear in the proximal descending aorta. You put in an endograft that covers the primary intima tear, and then the main point here is to redirect the flow into the true lumen and decrease a flow that goes into the false lumen. Again, it's not like an aneurysm where you want to completely exclude uh, the, uh, the segment, uh, the, the false lumen, because if you oversize the endograft, you may actually cause more problems because you can make a new rupture here. Again, the goal is to redirect the flow from the true lumen back into the true lumen and avoid uh, pressurizing and flow in the false lumen. And that will re-establish flow in all those vessels that come off the true lumen. Here again, I think I have uh, one or two quick examples here. So this is the classic constellation, 52-year-old uh, man, severe hypertension, presents with acute type B dissection. He has severe abdominal pain radiating to the back, decreased bowel sounds, his creatinine is rising, and also uh, uh, his lactic acid is also going up. So there's uh, suspicion, uh, clear clinical suspicion of signs that he has... Um, acute uh, mesenteric ischemia. And you see on those images here, has a little bit of a funny anatomy here. So you see the, the celiac artery really kind of goes up like this, but also the SMA has a curve up and then down again. And we can see already that there is something wrong here. You see the dissection flap uh, is, uh, is partially visualized right here. So now let's, let's look at those images and, um, and see what we, can, uh, what we can see here. I don't know if this is going to All right, so this is the one that doesn't play. So again, this patient has a, a section. You see the true lumen is already relatively small uh, here, and we are just above the celiac artery here. And then here we are a little bit lower. So now this is a section that goes right uh, through uh, just above the origin of the SMA. And because the SMA makes this funny loop here, we have SMA here and SMA here. So what you see here is that the true lumen is collapsed. The true lumen is very small. The false lumen is, uh, is large. And you see that the section also gets into the SMA. And there is, in fact, some true lumen in the SMA, but it's very small and also compressed. And here some true lumen is also compressed. So this patient has the worst case scenario. So he has both problems that we just mentioned. He has a limited inflow, so he has a true lumen collapse. But in addition, he has a dissection going into the SMA, and he has a windsock, like a false lumen goes in there, but it has no re-entry tear, and the false lumen blocks the true lumen, or what's left of the true lumen to begin with. So again, what's the treatment? 
obviously first what you need to do is you want to re-establish flow into the true lumen by putting in an endograft uh, into the proximal decent aorta, redirecting flow back into the true lumen. And then if it turns out that the, uh, the SMA is still not well perfused, which you can do by checking this angiographically, you can then still put a stent graft into the SMA uh, to keep the true lumen uh, uh, open. But again, you would always start obviously with reestablishing true lumen flow first. And here we have a pre and post images. So here you have now the flow in the, fall, in the true lumen is much improved as before. Here it was completely collapsed. Then you see the still two overlapping stents in the SMA uh, reestablishing uh, uh, excellent uh, flow to the SMA. Another case, this is I think is from just a few, uh, few weeks ago, is again the outside images with uh, all kinds of artifacts. So you see the patient is a type B dissection, probably starts in the arch, but the primary intima tear is uh, somewhat here close to the subclavian, maybe also uh, in the arch. And then when we look down the images, again, this is how we, uh, how a type B dissection typically looks. But the more we go distally, it starts to look a little bit funny. Here you see the true lumen is really small. Again, remember that looks like a rubber band. It really tries to contract, particularly in young people, it contracts uh, quite a bit. And then if we get even further down the thoracic aorta, you can see the true lumen almost collapses here. Here it's kind of pushed from two sides uh, and it remains a slit-like opening. And you can see the, the celiac artery may be compromised and here we have now full true lumen collapse, same as before, of the uh, superior mesenteric artery. And then further down, here's renals, and then true lumen collapse also in the inferior aorta. Here's the inferior mesenteric artery coming off the collapsed true lumen. And then you see the also true lumen collapse uh, even in the uh, iliac artery. Now this was again treated with an endograft because the 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 section started uh, in the arch. This was in fact done with a, a what's called a zone two TVAR. So TVAR is, as you know, thoracic endovascular aortic repair, the new word for stent grafting. And zone two means that your proximal end of the stent graft is not distal to the subclavian, but distal to the second branch vessel, distal to the parotid. And because they cover the subclavian artery, they also uh, put in a plug or an amplapsal device into the subclavian artery to prevent backflow from the subclavian artery. And they often also do a subclavian to carotid bypass to revascularize it. So the other thing that you will notice here that the stent graft looks a little bit funny because the proximal part of the stent graft looks like what you would expect. And this is the most commonly used uh, endograft here for thoracic aorta, which is the GORE, the C tag for conformable thoracic uh, aortic uh, uh, graft. But you will see more distally, the, the device looks uh, different. And that is because this is in fact a different device. Uh, they mix the different uh, vendors together. So I don't know if this is, uh, if this is illegal from the, uh, from the vendor's perspective. But essentially the, the cook has a, what's called a dissection device. So that's it. It looks like a state graft, but it, is only a stent. So it's a stent that is uncovered, and this is why it's allowed to extend it beyond the branch vessels. If it was a stent graft, you cannot stent over the SMA and the celiac artery because they would get ischemic. But since those are uncovered, uh, that uh, is possible. And this is called a dissection device. They are using this more and more, so you may see one of those uh, once in a while. This also has been referred to as a petticoat principle because uh, this is um, because it essentially tries to make a, uh, a frame uh, over which the true lumen or the intima flap can sit. And if you look here, post procedure, the stent graft in place. This is a larger device here. Really opens up the true lumen very nicely. The false lumen is completely gone here. Then more distally, we have this smaller device. It is is supposed to expand over time, right? And then make the true lumen as big as the original vessel. But again, the main point is it re-establishes flow in the true lumen uh, to the celiac artery and to the, uh, to the SMA. And again, you wonder, oh no, did they, did they shut out the SMA? And again, no, it's not because this device 
does not have a fabric. It's only metal frames, and so uh, this uh, SMA will be uh, better perfused than before. Okay. Uh, there's one. Um, uh, so here's just a, out of a out of the literature the, where it was described first. This is called a petticoat concept, which means that you have a proximal device that is a stent graft, and you have a distal device that is only a stent. Uh, the idea being that it will re-expand the true lumen and hopefully result in thrombosis of the false lumen uh, as a consequence of that. All right, we're almost done. Final piece is uh, the limited intimal tear or limited dissection or uh, one of those dissection variants that you may, uh, may come across. And this brings us back to the patient that I uh, showed you earlier to demonstrate how important it is to have uh, motion artifact-free images. And I think everybody agreed that we have an aortic lesion here, but we didn't elaborate more uh, what kind of lesion this is because it doesn't look like that this is a classic dissection. This looks like a dissection on this one slice, but it doesn't look like a classic dissection on all the other slices. So. Let me walk you through this case and show you also some other images which are uh, very important clues here. So on the top row, you see the patient's non contrast scan. And what you can see here is a little bit of a hyperattenuating uh, uh, zone here. So this is, as we all know, a small area of an intramural hematoma, which is in the patient's uh, arch. And we know that this is in the media this is an intramural hematoma because we see the calcification which sits on the intima is displaced by that uh, intramural hematoma. Now here the, the uh, axial image is here and that's the one that I've shown you before. There's one slice that looks like a dissection because there's what looks like a dissection membrane. But when we go one slice lower, you see it looks kind of uh, separated from this flap, but then it doesn't go anywhere. And if we go higher up, if we go distally, the flap is gone, but we still see this focal bulging of the aorta. And also the patient has a little bit of pericardial fluid, so we know that something is going wrong, but what kind of lesion is that? And what helps again is if you do some uh, reformats and some 3D renderings, etc. and uh, what shows it very nicely here, so this is a corona reformat, Again, this little filling defect, the linear filling defect, corresponds to this little lip here, if you want. And then the outpouching of the uh, remainder of the aortic wall corresponds to this big bulge here. So the aorta bulges out, and then it ends up right here in the arch where we know that this is in the patient's uh, intramural blood. So there's this little IMH that sits on this end, and on this end of the lesion you have uh, a little undermined edge here. But then when you look in 3D and uh, somebody is kind enough to make some errors and some dots to you, this shows what the lesion really represents. The lesion is in fact a, a vertical tear of the aorta ranging from the proximal ascending aorta all the way up to the arch. And the edges of the tear, they are stretched open. So it's kind of a rich result in this big bulge and on the proximal end, you have a little bit of an undermined edge here. And that's what's called a limited intimal tear. And that patient uh, went to the OR and it was uh, also surgically confirmed. So what is a limited intimal tear? So what are we talking about? So uh, if you think about making a cross section here at this level, other than a aortic dissection where you have uh, like a blood flow between the true and the false lumen, this is in fact a partial thickness tear from the intima varia, variable depth into the uh, media. But once the media is torn, uh, you have a tear here, and the edges of the tear will stretch open. They will pull apart because again, this part of the media is elastic. So if you open this up, it will retract and will expose more of the underlying, whatever is left of the media and adventitia. And, the adventitia, and then the remainder of that wall the of the adventitia will bulge out, and this will result in this bulging here. Yeah. So other than dissection, this is kind of a focal bulge uh, of a partial thickness tear with retracted uh, edges here. And here's a surgical uh, correlation here. This was done, unfortunately, without contrast uh, 
but uh, the surgical correlation is still nice here. You see, this is the, the bulge of the aorta. Uh, it looks a little bit, the whole wall looks a little bit hemorrhagic. And then and this is the, uh, when they look down into the root. So here's the, uh, the aortic valve. Then this part of the wall, you see this, this stellate shaped tear. So this is the nuded aorta. This is the kind of the intimal medial flap that has been uh, torn away. And this is how it looks like the tear is kind of sharp and uh, like this, but then the, the nuded aorta looks like this. So this is what the, the limited tear looks like uh, in this particular case here. And it's obviously not a new lesion. It has been described uh, in the 30s in the, patho in the pathologic literature. So uh, you could think about it as a spectrum of these lesions that can penetrate through the aortic wall or they can uh, get into the wall, then result in a dissection, uh, or the false lumen can dilate in the same case. And our uh, example, the limited tear, is this situation here. You have a relatively large primary intima tear with the retracted edges, and the remainder of the wall bulges out. But there are all kinds of case reports since the 70s or so on the all kinds of different names. Uh, so that's probably why it's not well known. But the main paper that brought this into the literature was then by Lars Svensson, so who described this lesion then as a limited intima tear. It later became the class three aortic lesion, so I'm going to show you in a second. And so what they, uh, they base their, um, their, their diagnosis or this, this uh, entity on nine cases that they had in a series out of 181 patients it underwent surgical repair of the ascending aorta. Um, despite it didn't see a dissection on any of the imaging studies, so it was clinically driven and based on maybe the aorta being aneurysma. And a lot of these patients had uh, one or more preoperative imaging studies, like either aortography, which tells you it's an old paper, uh, a TEE, a C CT, or or an R. And this is how they look. So you have again the focal out pouching, and you see the denuded aorta here, and this is the remainder of this flap, which is just stretched open. And uh, based on this paper, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the limited dissection or limited intimate made it into the official AHA uh, classification of uh, uh, aortic, uh, uh, acute aortic uh, lesions, and also the European uh, uh, society has included this lesion here, kind of the type 3 lesion here, into its classification. But for the longest time, I'd never heard about this, despite it's in the classification. Uh, but the reason simply is because uh, one of the hallmarks of this lesion was, at least historically, that you cannot see it on imaging, at least not in the past. But once you know that this lesion exists, you will find them. And this is why I'm showing you these cases, because I'm sure you will see this, or you may have seen some of them in your life, and you were just not sure how to call them. So um, uh, uh, here's one example. When, uh, when Dr. Chin went back to Montreal, uh, she sent me this case very soon. You can see a patient with a bicuspid aortic valve with a little bit of an IMH here in the arch. Uh, here's it, it, this image of the bicuspid aortic valve, a little bit of pericardial fluid as well. And then you see this funny outpouching here in the arch and a little bit of a linear filling defect. This one looks maybe like a dissection on one slice, but again, this is not a classic dissection. But again, if you do a 3D reconstruction of that, I mean, it's just uh, eye-opening what kind of lesion that is. It's so simple. You have a lesion that is a parallel to the arch vessel, so you have a parallel longitudinal tear in the aorta. It's a partial thickness tear. And these edges are just because the aorta is stretched open and the edges of those lesions are a little bit undermined. And this is what we see. We see essentially the luminogram, the contrast that fills that uh, limited uh, intima tear in this case. Another, uh, another example, we had a, a visitor from uh, Medellin in Colombia. And also after he returned to St. In this case, again, a very small uh, limited intima tear that is patient in the ascending aorta. And so we ultimately we wrote this up and we looked at how many cases we have in, in uh, uh, Stanford. And uh, this is where 
our entire cohort of acute dissections comes from. And so we found 24 of these lesions out of 500, so also about 5%. So we see, again, one or two a year, sometimes three a year of these uh, limited intima tears uh, uh, at, uh, at our site. And uh, again, most of them are type A, uh, some of them are, are type B. I don't want to go into detail. The main uh, risk factors was that they're usually a bit older than classic dissections. They usually have ascending aneurysms or mildly aneurysmal aortas, which is similar, however, as you would see in any type A dissection. Um, and most of the tears are circumferential or little more circumferential ones and longitudinal ones. They, the tears can be uh, over two centimeters up to seven centimeters. I'll show an example of that. The width, this is how much they stretch open, can be up to four centimeters. And the edges can usually be undermined and they can either be filled with contrast, which makes them look like little focal dissections, or the undermined edges can also be filled with cloth. And then they have some images that look like, uh, remind you of uh, IMH. And so the outer bulge can obviously be larger than the luminal dimension of the tear because they can be, again, they, they have undermined uh, edges. So this is an example of a relatively large tear. Again, you see on the ascending order, we come here from top, uh, uh, we go here from bottom to, to top here. So we start the ascending order, you see on one slice, you see something that looks like a dissection. On the next slice, you see a bulge, right? And then on the next slice, you still see the bulge with a little bit of an edge here. And then you see another edge here, and then you see another bulge here. Again, on axial images, it's very difficult to figure out what, what's really uh, going on here. But again, if you have a 3D image, it's very obvious. And we have a, again, this is a longitudinal tear. This was about seven centimeters starting in the ascending water, going all the way through the arch here. And here's the endoluminal view. If you see again, the arch starts here uh, and uh, it goes all the way here to the, to the arch. So it's a, a really large uh, uh, limited uh, intima tear. And I think he had a surgical uh, correlation too. Not the greatest pictures, but you see the tear essentially is really sharp. And then you have this undermined uh, uh, edges here. Pathologically, we looked this all up. And so the long story short is that all of the patients who went to, to the OR and where we had specimens were only 10, but they all had uh, cystic media degeneration or media degeneration. So they confirmed that, that it is a variant of dissection. So it's not uh, a PAU or not a penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer. So it's really among the dissection spectrum. And only three of those patients had just mild athero, which would be the hallmark of a penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer. Um, one case was completely missed. All the other ones we detected, uh, I would say, um, uh, prospectively. Uh, so one lesion was not detected at all. And there were six of them which were called correctly as acute aortic syndromes, which I think is the most important. I mean, as long as you call it out as an acute aortic syndrome, all the rest will fall in place. Uh, and it doesn't really matter that you called it not a limited intima tear or anything else. But not surprisingly, there were two patients where the initial report called them INH, which is not surprising because as we have seen before, these undermined edges can just be filled with clot. And some were uh, thought that they would be, uh, be PAUs because of those contours that were, that were seen. And uh, uh, two were called rupturing aneurysms, which is also not totally wrong because if they the aorta is dilated and you say the aorta is aneurysma, then you know, may also be called a rupture aneurysm. So here's an example that was completely missed. Uh, so, and I would argue it's really very subtle. There's a very subtle bulge in the descending thoracic aorta. Uh, so we didn't do this 3D at the time of the being, but in retrospect, when you look at the 3D, this is a view of that. It is in fact quite obvious on the 3D image that there's a focal bulge of the descending thoracic aorta. Then we only know that the patient had this lesion because they had a follow-up study uh, just uh, a few days later. And again, on the, on the axial images, it's really hard to see 
that it's, it's just a little contour irregularity. Then on the 3Ds, you can clearly see that this lesion has grown, which is because it behaves like a false lumen, right? So you would expect it to dilate and bulge a little bit uh, over time if it gets, uh, if it gets uh, larger. Uh, Treatment-wise, so our, there is obviously no treatment guidelines what to do, but essentially type A lesions would go to surgery here. Uh, we treat them essentially like dissections, and type B lesions would be treated or managed medically unless uh, there were patients who had signs of, of rupture. So the in-hospital mortality and 30-day mortality of limited intimatea seems to be maybe a little bit more benign than other acute aortic syndromes. But then if you look at the survival at 12 months or over 10 years even, I mean, they just early on, they look a little bit better than patients who have a dissection IMH or, uh, or penetrating atherosclerotic ulcers. But in the end, they have obviously underlying aortic disease. In the long run, they are kind of similar as the, the other acute aortic syndromes. The only outlier is obviously the rupturing uh, aneurysms, but they have very high uh, initial and uh, uh, long-term mortality. So here's the final case. A patient, uh, a 54-year-old uh, lawyer, uh, the brother of a, a cardiologist um, uh, at Stanford, uh, had severe chest pain when he was water skiing. Very appropriately, so they uh, worked him up for an acute coronary syndrome, and um, which included uh, as a, a, a stress echo first. So when they detected the stress echo, they saw that the acyl aorta was a bit aneurysmal. So they said, okay, maybe we should do a CT first. And that's the CT scan that was done uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the East Coast. And it's not a gated study. It's three millimeter thick, se thick section. So it's not, I mean, a, a super fancy CT angio, but I think it still shows the main pathology. And what I would like you to try to see in those images is those limited tears that we just discussed. And if you are very, look very careful, we hit the root. If you come up, you can see there's one bulge here, but it is, it stands out. You do see double contours everywhere because it's motion artifact, you know, but motion artifacts are usually on both sides of the aorta, but this kind of thing stands out. You see that? So something is odd here. And so the next thing you would usually do is if you have anything like this is a, the study was by the way, read as negative, um, both by the, by the radiologist who looked at it and also by the, an experienced surgeon, surgeon who looked at it. But when you just do some, simple coronary formats, and you can see that this does not look like a motion artifact. So something's wrong here in this patient's ascending aorta, and we do some oblique views, you still see this little outpouching here. So um, I suggested uh, to the patient's brother, who was a cardiologist, to say, well, your brother should rather go and have his aorta fixed uh, immediately, because I think that this is one of these... Uh, uh, limited intimate tears, and you know they they can rupture. They are not they're totally benign, and it's a type A lesion. And uh, as you may have experienced in your life as uh, as a radiologist, and uh, I can promise you, you will experience in the future is that the clinicians usually don't listen to your clinical advice, and I would say probably that's a good thing. Uh, but in this case, they also didn't send the patient to the OR, but they had the idea of shipping the patient from the East Coast to Stanford and uh, re-evaluating him there. And uh, so I didn't think it's a great idea, but it gave us the opportunity to re-scan the patient. So we did another, now a gated, stat, a gated study with thin cuts. Uh, this was mainly done to rule out uh, any coronary abnormalities uh, preoperatively. And the uh, now shows very nicely how this lesion uh, really looks like. So you can see this lesion is now circumferential. So this is an aorta, and you have a circumferential tear. Again, you see the tear is stretched open. It's about a centimeter wide or something, and it's about 180 degrees of the circumference. So half of the aortic circumference is kind of has this partial thickness tear. Then when you look from the inside, you can see how 
wide, it's stretched open. Right? So you can see uh, that it's um, um, bulging uh, and it's bulging out. And here's the, uh, the surgical correlation. So you see the patient before he is on, on cardiopulmonary bypass and, and it doesn't look as dramatic on the surgical correlation, but it's this lesion here. So this lesion here corresponds to this lesion here. And uh, what you see here is that the, orta, the aortic wall is so thin. You see, the normal aortic wall is yellowish and yellowish is elastin. Elastin is yellow because there's obviously no fat in the aortic wall. So this is elastin and here you have nothing yellow. So the media is essentially missing. So that is this tear uh, of the ascending aorta. The reason why we see it better on CT is because the CT shows you the blood, essentially the luminogram. Right? And then when they look down at the aorta, you see how this bulge is out here uh, once they are starting to repair it. But I think the best uh, uh, picture is really this one here because that's the pathology specimen of this patient's uh, 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 limited tear. And you can see it looks like a huge rent. And they will say, well, wait a minute, didn't you say it's like a one centimeter wide tear? This is kind of looks like a, a rent. It doesn't have any width. But again, the pathology specimen is not pressure fixated. So it's just how the wall looks. And this is how the tear looks when it starts or when it happens acutely. But if the water is pressurized, then of course, these things will stretch open and you will have the bulge out of the aortic wall. So that's also a surgically confirmed uh, limited intima tear. So just to summarize that part, so limited tears are rare, but since we do see two or three a year, you may in fact see one. And if you read enough of these uh, aortic studies, you will for sure uh, encounter them in your career in the future. So we think that they are a variant of aortic dissection because they are in the, you have medial degeneration, they are more type A than type B, uh, and uh, they, they, we treat them usually like any dissection. The prognosis may be a little bit better early on, but in the end, they are very similar as any patient who has a cystic medial disease and a aortic uh, a dissection or an acute aortic syndrome. But one key element is really that these lesions can be seen on any state-of-the-art CT these days, particularly if you use gating and particularly if you use some additional 3D rendering to make these lesions much more conspicuous because then you can also uh, identify them. But I'll promise you that by just knowing that these lesions exist, you'll be able to detect them. So that's already uh, the, the end. Uh, I covered a little bit of the imaging strategy, main points being you want to always do it non-contrast scans, try to use gating or repeat it with gated if you haven't done so for the chest and always include the, the iliofemoral arteries because you want to have a roadmap for an interventionalist or a vascular surgeon. The pathology, the hallmark is really that the, the, the false lumen, the flap consists mostly of media, is elastic, it behaves like a, a rubber band and that a type A dissection is a dissection that involves the ascending aorta. And if not, then it's a type B. Side branch ischemia can be either local problem or an inflow problem. The first one can be treated locally. The second one usually with an endograft. And then I think uh, in the future, you will have no trouble identifying one of those dissection variants uh, uh, in the future. Thank you for your attention, and those who still have some time, that's still um, open for a question. Sorry, do, do, can I sneak in a quick question? This is Armin, one of the incoming body fellows. Ah. Um, my question is, uh, I know you mentioned for type A that's really kind of ascending aorta. Um, how would you, would you still classify um, intimal flaps that go kind of are still superior to the left subclavian artery, but don't really extend all the way to the arch. Do you, that some places I know they use the left subclavian border to call type A versus type B, but is it at Stanford specifically we're calling A only in the ascending aorta? Uh, yes. 
and and that's that's also what's now recognized i think in the um, in uh, in the in most of the modern guidelines right so the uh, i mean the the stanford classification really aimed to identify those who need surgery and who always need to go to surgery immediately and that is only patients who have an ascending involvement right so if the arch is involved um, but there are no other complications the patient does not need to go to the OR. Right. I think the underlying physiology is essentially that if you have a dissection that happens within the pericardial space, that's really what's the, what's dangerous, right? Because not only that it can rupture, but even without rupturing, you have some fluid that seeps through the wall and they can tampon out. Mm-hmm. So that's really what the classification should be. And it was always meant like this, but the surgeons, it, that they didn't specifically explain how they would treat the arch. And the reason is that in the 70s, you couldn't operate on the arch. You can only operate in the arch at the, at the late 70s or early 80s once they came up with anti-grade cerebral perfusion and putting the patients in deep hypothermic arrest. But again, the main point is that uh, how it's interpreted here and I think in the most of the surgical world, the Images are a little bit behind usually, but the surgeon would consider a type A dissection only a dissection where the ascending is involved, the patient who needs his ascending were to replace. That's really what they, what, um, uh, what it means. Perfect. Thank you so much. Now, I'm sure you're going to find some literature where it's still uh, illustrated uh, differently or I would say incorrectly, but I guess the Stanford surgeons can, can decide how they want what they want their classification really to mean. Mm-hmm.